All right. All right. Um, calling to order the Investment Advisory Committee meeting of July 26, 2021. Uh, welcome all. Thanks for being here. Uh, first thing on the agenda is the roll call. Um, so uh, Steve Noblock. Steve is not here. Art Carter. Present. Okay. Al Sondak. Al is not here. Bill Blackwell. I'm here. I'm here. Okay. Thank you, Bill. And um, Sandy Chiswick from the city and Jason Schmidt from uh, Chandler Investments. Very good. Thanks all for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, first thing on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of the April 26, 2021 meeting. Uh, are there any comments or changes or corrections for those minutes? Okay, if not, do I have a motion to approve the minutes as presented? So moved, even though I wasn't there at Hey, you can do that. Until 5.32. You can do that. Bill, do I have I'll, a I'll second it. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. Bill? Aye. 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 So moved. Okay. Next up on the agenda is the investment report for the fourth quarter fiscal year 2020-2021. So, um, Jason, if you'll start us off there, and if we could give Jason uh, control to share his screen, that would be great. You know, while, while we're doing that, um, one thing I do want to note um, is that uh, this is Bill's last meeting on the Investment Advisory Committee. No way. Yes, it is. He's been our. He's been on the committee before I was ever associated with it, and then came back onto it, and um, has been our industry specialist for gosh, how long, Bill? Oh, uh, I think about. I know it's been three or four years on this second stint. I think at least, yeah. yeah. And we yeah. really, really appreciate all that you brought to the meetings and your expertise. And uh, sad to see you go, but I'm happy for. It sounds like you're gonna do a little bit more traveling and slow down a little bit at work. So wish you the best on that. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, just want to make sure everybody knows that I'm certainly available. If anybody uh, ever needs anything, uh, any help or anything like that, um, I'm unofficially available to any of you and uh, be happy to help out. Thanks, Bill. And um, the, the council will be appointing um, the open spots. So I, Art, I don't know if you reapplied, but uh, they'll be doing that in August, I believe. Uh, actually, it's uh, tomorrow. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, and I did reapply. Hope that's okay. You say you did. I did, yes. Okay, great. Okay, Jason, take it away. Sandy can, uh, Sandy can uh, confirm that. Yes. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit about what's been going on in the economy. So things change very quickly. Uh, so some of the comments that we've even written today, uh, there's been some more developments as, as far as it relates back to uh, potential restrictions uh, being um, imposed once again um, on a more lighter level than we saw you know, about a year or so ago. Um, but uh, definitely we continue to see where uh, the variants uh, are, are affecting uh, just the economy in general. Uh, with that, with that in, in mind, uh, Jason, really go ahead. Yeah, this is Art. Can you turn your mic up a little bit, or maybe get a little closer to your computer? Let me see. I don't know if I can turn my mic up. Give me one second. I don't. I don't think you can. I think it's just a matter of. Um, yeah, being close enough to it, but I, I, I can hear you. I'm, I'm good. Thank you, Jason. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So I think, you know, when we think about what's going on in the economy today, definitely the variants have, have, def, have uh, you know, taken their toll. 
uh, as far as uh, the recovery uh, that the market was expecting. Uh, at least at this point in time, people are thinking is a little bit uh, less robust uh, than it otherwise may have been. And so really one, one of the things that's really impacting the economy, of course, is the fiscal stimulus. Uh, depending upon uh, what uh, hour in the day, there is potentially a plan for um, infrastructure spending that can occur. Depending upon what plan that you're looking at, it might be as much as $3 trillion or a little bit less than a trillion dollars. And so that is really the next thing that's coming down the pipe. We still are expecting that uh, the economy will continue to grow. Also, the National Bureau of Economic uh, Statistics, basically their neighbor, uh, released uh, just about a week ago, uh, telling us uh, that uh, you know they they are the uh, agency that's really tasked with looking at uh, recessions and things like that, and giving us the timing of those recessions. And so we had a two-month recession uh, way back in 2020. And since that period of time, we've been in an economic expansion. And so that is something that has been the shortest recession uh, that has ever been on record. In fact, uh, if you think about uh, financial markets and some of the nomenclature there, uh, typically what has been thought about is two negative uh, consecutive quarters of uh, GDP growth would uh, constitute a recession. And uh, so it's even smaller than that. Uh, as far as what they're looking at today. And the reason it was so short is because you, A, you had a lot of uh, monetary stimulus through the Federal Reserve, not only here in the United States, but also globally, and then also the fiscal side of the equation in the sense that not only here in the United States, but also globally, there was a large amount of, sti uh, uh, of um, stimulus that it took place. Uh, the Bloomberg estimate right now for GDP growth is around 6.6%. Uh, and for 2022, it's about 4.1% uh, per annum. Uh, we're definitely going to see a, a very robust third quarter and likely a robust fourth quarter uh, at the same time. Uh, even though we do have some of the variants that are out there, um, our viewpoint is that yes, you will see a little bit of a decline of what the expectation was, but it's definitely not going to derail uh, what's already in place as far as uh, uh, folks uh, you know, really uh, spending and getting uh, in some ways back to uh, what their lives uh, were like, at least in some way, shape, or form, uh, were before. Uh, the Federal Market Open Market Committee uh, met in June. Uh, they still keep their federal funds rate uh, at that zero bound between uh, zero and 0.5. Again, they meet uh, this week too. I believe that's on the 28th uh, that they meet uh, this week too. Uh, we don't expect you know a huge amount of um, surprises there, um, but you never know. And so we will definitely be uh, watching that. They continue to purchase assets, uh, essentially $40 billion per month of mortgage-backed securities and also $80 billion per month of U.S. Treasury securities. Uh, we think that that's going to continue to be in play. Um, we think that probably we'll get an indication of if the Fed is going to stop or at least taper some of its asset purchases uh, when we start to see the Jackson Hole Summit, uh, and that's going to be in kind of that later October area. Uh, and that's when there are a lot of central bankers and things like that meet, including the Federal Reserve. And in the past, we've seen where the Fed and other central banks might have had a change in policy. Sometimes they will uh, give presentations on that kind of to float that trial balloon uh, to the markets that, hey, maybe there is a change that's going about here. So we will definitely be uh, attuned uh, to the comments that are coming out of the Jackson Hole. In uh, June, the, the uh, yield curve flattened. And so what we really did is we had uh, short-term rates, they come up a little bit, uh, longer-term rates, especially uh, that's where most of the activity took place. I'll show that a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, they came down over that uh, period of time. Uh, we believe that uh, longer term rates are likely to move higher even in, in lieu of that. Uh, and also we are continuing to see uh, heightened inflation expectations uh, that are starting to work their way through the market. Most uh, the Federal Reserve and a lot of other participants think that those will be transitory. And no one ever really defines what transitory is as far as the time frame. Uh, and so we'll have to see what that really means. I think sometimes transitory means is the uh, time frame uh, that it really takes in order for my uh, estimate to come, come true. And so we'll have to see if that's really what, what happens uh, in this case. Moving on to page four, here you can see on the left-hand side, you can see here is non-farm payrolls. Uh, you can see the dashed line there is the three month moving average. The green line there is just the monthly payrolls. Payrolls have been a little bit soft in some of the months. Uh, we haven't seen as much hiring. There's a lot of things that are going on today. You have enhanced unemployment benefits. Remember that those 
go away on the federal level unless more legislation takes place on uh, September 6th. And uh, also in about 25 or 26 states uh, in June, uh, we saw a lot of the, the states start to get rid of those enhanced unemployment benefits uh, by the federal government. Uh, there is some, uh, you know, some, some evidence that uh, that may be causing some folks not to, to go back to work. And so we'll have to kind of see how that kind of uh, goes through uh, the system. So I think that right now, some of the economic numbers, um, you know, to use a scientific term, are a little bit dirty right now, meaning that uh, uh, we are looking at year-over-year -year numbers uh, and things like that, that uh, really, uh, if you look at the rebounds and things like that, uh, are just uh, from historical uh, kind of lower levels. And we're seeing at some very year-over-year -year numbers at some very high levels. Uh, you can see on the uh, left-hand side here, that's the unemployment rate. The green line there is the unemployment rate. That's the headline number, the U3. And then we have the U6 or the underemployment rate. That's the dashed line there. Uh, so again, you can see that the U3 is kind of leveled off here. The U6 continues to move uh, downward. Our expectation is that employment will continue to expand. Uh, we definitely have uh, a lot of folks uh, relative to what we were at at pre-pandemic levels are still unemployed at this period of time. And so we still have some room to go here as far as bringing this back down uh, to those pre-pandemic levels, but uh, that is definitely going to take a little bit longer time. We're not gonna see what we saw uh, early on as far as uh, the declines in unemployment and also the increases in employment. Moving on to the next page, that's on page five. This is looking at initial jobless claims, so a little bit more frequent uh, indicator. This is done on a weekly basis. Uh, the bottom line there is uh, the uh, bars are the weekly unemployment claims. The dashed line there are what we call the continuing claims. Notice that the continuing claims are kind of leveling off. They are still trying, trending lower, uh, but definitely not trending as, as, as low as we saw uh, early on as we start, start to see uh, you know, massive increases in employment and things like that. So uh, definitely we continue to, look, to watch these numbers. Uh, they're probably a little bit less uh, important uh, than uh, they were early on in the pandemic in the sense that it was one of those places that we could get weekly readings about what was going on in the labor markets. As we move forward from here, this is really the big picture that most market participants are focused in on. This is inflation. On the left-hand side there, you can see the dashed line there is the core CPI or consumer price index. And then you can see the green line there is the uh, headline number there. Look at the headline number on a year-over-year -year basis uh, if you look at CPI around 5% and some pretty massive numbers. Remember, we're coming off of very low bases though, meaning that uh, this is uh, a year ago and, and things like that, we were seeing very low levels of commodities, things like that. And now we're starting to see some of those commodities come back. We also have supply chain issues and things like that. This is the piece that the Federal Reserve is saying is transitory. We'll have to see if that's really the case. So we'll be continuing to monitor that, um, but definitely as we see higher housing prices, you would think that's going to also uh, filter its way into rents. Remember, if you look at the CPI, about 30% of that is what we call rent equivalency. And so uh, we'll have to see if that continues uh, to, to be at elevated levels or if we start to see that subside in the future. And I don't think it's good to look at the anecdotes. You know, we have seen where lumber prices have come down. Some of those other things have come down. Remember that the CPI is a very broad measure. So even though one or two measures might be coming down, we could see some of the other measures that are coming back up. And so we'll have to continue to watch that as we move forward. Um, we have things, weird things in the CPI that have been causing it to move forward. Used car prices, new car prices. It continues to shift to different areas, hotels, airfares, things like that. So if that continues to be part of that, and I think the big thing to watch there is actually wage levels. If wage levels continue to be at those elevated levels, then definitely you'll likely see that continue to filter in there. Our viewpoint is we start to see at least some higher levels of inflation. So if you look at the last decade, we're about one and a half to 2% on a core level. This is on the PCE, which is on the right hand, hand side there. The green line there being the headline, the core being the dash line. Uh, you could probably see where you're between two and a half to, to 3% moving forward uh, with different types of inflation measures. And so definitely over time, that should cause interest rates to be at some more elevated levels, but uh, we're not expecting 1970s type inflation but we do think that you're going to start to see where there's an elevated level of inflation given where we're at today. Moving on to the next page, here you can see your consumer price index. I'm sorry, the uh, GDP, gross domestic product. On the left-hand side here, you can see the chart. This is looking at the last four quarters. Uh, so you can see really the last week quarter that we had 
was basically June of 2020, where we had really had that bad quarter. If you look at towards the very bottom there, down 31.4%. Since that period of time, you have the recovery back in the uh, third quarter. The fourth quarter had positive growth, pretty robust growth, and also the first quarter of 2021 also seeing very, very high growth. Uh, if we get to some of the growth rates that we're projecting or are being projected in 2021, those would be some of the highest growth rates that we've seen in the economy as far as GDP since probably around the early 80s, probably 1983 is the last time that we've seen some of those numbers. So definitely uh, we're, we're projecting in, in a, a very strong recovery and we've already seen a lot of that in uh, 2021. And then if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you can see there's the maroon line there is the year-over-year -year change. And then you can see the quarter over quarter change. Notice that the maroon line now has gone on a year-over-year -year basis back up to that positive number. And so that's showing us that uh, really we're starting to see that recovery. We're still below pre-pandemic levels uh, when you look at the overall GDP and economic activity, uh, but definitely we're gravitating towards that top. Any questions on the economy before I move forward? All right, moving forward. Let's look at the consolidated portfolio of the city. And we're gonna look at uh, June 30. And we're gonna look at the portfolio, which is in the center uh, of this table versus that of the benchmark. And then uh, we're gonna look at the uh, average maturity uh, to start off with. So the average maturity of the portfolio is 1.46. The average duration is 1.38. Uh, the average purchase yield is 1.08. The average market yield is 0.32. It's a AA plus portfolio and the portfolio is approximately $160.5 million. Notice that on the average maturity and the average duration, we're less than that of the benchmark. Uh, that's because we're including both the internal and the external portfolio. If you look at the channel managed portfolio, as we will in the future, uh, later on in the presentation, you'll see that we're much closer to that benchmark as far as that's concerned. Here you can see the average historical purchase yield. So you can see that's been coming down. Uh, so as of June, we're down to about 1.08 on the purchase yield basis. Uh, if you think about LAFE, if you had just kept all your money in LAFE, and right now LAFE is around 22 basis points. And so by purchasing some of these longer term securities while also uh, looking at the liquidity side, you've been able to keep your purchase yield at least competitive uh, north of 1%, even as in this very low interest rate environment that we're in today. Here you can see looking at the uh, earnings comparison, and you can see uh, on this graph here, this fiscal, court, uh, fiscal uh, Q4 and then fiscal year to date. And what you can see here in the green line is that of uh, June of 21. And then the gray line there is June of 20. And you can see that we've seen a decline in the overall earnings of the portfolio. That's really to be expected. If the portfolio stays at somewhat of a, a, a static rate as far as the overall uh, balance of the portfolio and you have lower yields, you're going to earn less. And so that's really why you've seen the decline in rates there. And then on page 12, here you can see the different asset allocations. And so looking at the table above, we're going from uh, left to right, see the sector, the market value as of 630, the market value as of uh, March 31st, and then the yield on that and also the duration and then those changes there. And you can see really the biggest change is really into US treasuries. Uh, so more money being put into US treasuries. Credit spreads are relatively low today. Uh, so there aren't as many opportunities. In fact, in the agency side of the equation, uh, depending upon if you're buying callable securities, uh, but if you're just buying, looking at bullet securities, a lot of times uh, what you'll see is that the yield on treasuries is actually above that of uh, US agency securities, especially in the short end of the yield curve. So if we're giving those two opportunities, we will choose the US treasury it has some better dynamics as far as uh, looking at marketability and things like that. Here you can see on page 13, on the left-hand side, you can see as of June 30, on the right-hand side, you can see as March 31st, the overall sector allocation. I'm gonna focus on the left-hand side, which is uh, that of the uh, uh, June 30 sector allocation. So about 24% in US Treasury, Supernationals 1.3%, some negotiable CDs about 1.9%, the money market fund at 0.4%, uh, LAFE is around 30% of the portfolio. You can see corporates are about 5.7%. Cash is 0.7%. Agencies are around 33.5%. That's where you've seen the largest decline there, around 4%. And then you see asset-backed securities a little bit higher there, around 2.2% of the portfolio. So using all the tools in our toolbox, uh, and in particular, we've been uh, really trying to 
get as much allocation as we can to new issue securities. We think that, that right now in the marketplace, that's where the best deals are as far as the best opportunities mm. are. And so, uh, of course, we're competing with other uh, folks, investors, and things like that when we're going out to purchase those. Um, but uh, we try to use our uh, overall buying power in order to uh, help us to facilitate some of those bonds when they're out in the marketplace. Here you can see page 14, looking at industry holdings. And uh, you can see that uh, June is in the green, gray is as of March. And you can see that the investment pools make up around 30% of the portfolio. And then you see technology, retail, insurance, uh, energy, consumers, uh, capital goods. We don't have anything in basic industries today. Uh, banking uh, makes up a big percentage and, and the autos through Toyota Motor Credit and things like that make a percentage. And then government securities make up for actually the biggest percentage around almost 60% of the portfolio. And then you see, uh, looking at uh, corporates, uh, and here what we do is uh, we're looking at just the corporate sector, so the amount of corporates. So it's not really, uh, it doesn't get the uh, overall, uh, uh, doesn't include local government investment pools or uh, government securities. And here what you can see is that again, banking and automotive make up the biggest percentage. Then you have financial services and then technology. Uh, we don't necessarily have as much in technology anymore. Uh, so you can see that the technology piece has come down. We've had some securities mature off. And also technology companies aren't necessarily issuing as much debt. Uh, there were some tax law changes that took place a few years ago. And so they're not necessarily out there issuing like they were before. And then here you can see the quality distribution. Uh, so you can see that the portfolio, uh, everything is rated A or better on the S&P scale. Those securities that are not rated, rated are typically asset-backed securities and or life. Uh, and they will be uh, rated uh, by and, uh, Moody's and or Fitch. Uh, and so they qualify per the investment policy. Excuse me, Jason. Um, we, we keep using LAIF and those on the committee know what you're talking about, but just in case anyone um, listens to the YouTube live presentation, if you could just do a quick explanation of LAIF. Sure. So LAIF is the local agency investment fund. It's run by the state treasurer's office of the state of California. And this is uh, a uh, money market or very short-term liquid investment that local agencies can place their monies into. It's a very high quality pool. Uh, typically it's made up of very, very high quality short-term corporate securities and also government securities. And it allows uh, cities and, and, and uh, other local agencies uh, to be able to use that. There's a $75 million maximum uh, that can be placed into that fund. And it allows for any deposit that's in there is a dollar dollar in, dollar out. Uh, and so there is some, some, some limitations as far as how many withdrawals, but typically that doesn't have a big effect on most public agencies. Thank you. And then a duration distribution. Uh, so you can see in, in June is in the green, uh, the gray is that of March. And so you can see there's a lot of liquidity. Uh, typically this is a high liquid part of the, uh, of the, uh, of the city's budget. Uh, it typically collects a lot of its revenues and has its revenues as of June 30 at some of those higher levels. As we make it on through the year, through the year, as we get closer to October and November uh, and also parts of December, it will start to spend some of those uh, liquid balances. Uh, so as it's not collecting as much revenue. Here you can see uh, the duration distribution when it doesn't include cash and or life. So some of those liquidity measures. And so what you can see from here in your portfolios in the green, the gray is that of uh, March. And you can see that the majority of the maturities sit between that two to three year uh, sector. Uh, we do also have some four to five year securities, a little bit overweight uh, what we were back in March. But again, the majority of the securities are sitting between that two and three year sector. This is looking at total return on page 19. And this is looking at uh, the different portfolios along with uh, the different benchmarks that are down there. And so what you can see in the uh, graph above is you can see that the dark green line is the three month total return. The 12 month total return is in the gray. And then the lighter green is that since inception uh, number. And you, what you can see of going from left to right across the graph that includes the, the Chandler managed portfolio, then the city's internally managed portfolio. And then we consolidate those together uh, in order to get a total return. And then three benchmarks, uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, one to three or US Treasury agency benchmark, 
also a, uh, a, a government corporate benchmark that's between one and three years with securities rated between uh, a, uh, AAA and single A, and then also uh, the uh, zero to five year index. And if you think about the city's investable universe, it can purchase securities with maturities between zero and five years. So these are relevant benchmarks. And then when we look below there in the table below, you can see the three month to 12 month and since inception numbers. Uh, so the Chandler portfolio over the last three months earned seven basis points, 12 months 17 and since inception is 1.63. Uh, and then what you can see below that is the internally managed uh, eight basis points, 12 months is 49 basis points and since inception 1.11%. Remember that the internally managed portfolio is typically a little bit shorter has a lower, shorter term maturity than that of the Chandler portfolio. So that's gonna affect longer term returns uh, over time. And typically that will be less over that long-term uh, place in the sense inception number reflects that. And then also the consolidated. So over the last three months it earned eight basis points, 12 months was 32 basis points and since inception was 1.37. And then if you look at the returns below there over the last three months, the treasury agency index uh, was down around three basis points. Uh, over the 12 months, it was uh, up eight basis points over 12 months and since inception was up 1.42%. And then the one to three year uh, corporate government with corporate securities being uh, uh, AAA to A rated uh, was up one basis point, 27 basis points and 1.57. And then you can see the uh, zero to five year US treasury index uh, that was up nine basis points uh, over the last three months, it was actually down 18 basis points over the last 12 months. And then since inception, it was up 1.43% over that period of time. So, so Jason, before we move on from here, since the um, sort of five year US Treasury index is, is, is the, that, that's, that's the index which is pretty representative of the Chandler managed portfolio, correct? Correct, that's the one that best reflects uh, kind of the average duration of that and also the maturity structure that we can purchase at the same time. Okay, so, so what explains such a, a big divergence over the last 12 months between uh, the Chandler portfolio and that index? So if you look over the last 12 months, really uh, treasury securities have underperformed corporate securities. So remember that this benchmark is 100% in US treasury securities oh. and uh, the uh, portfolio uh, has treasury securities, as I mentioned before, but also can buy some other types of securities that have outperformed over the last 12 months. So, so the reason you've asked us to use that as the benchmark for the Chandler Manage is just really has to do with duration and not necessarily security makeup. Yes, it's duration and also the uh, distribution of where you can buy maturities. And that's one of the reasons why we include uh, the corporate government index in there between uh, one to three years. It has a similar duration, but also includes some corporate securities uh, so that the committee can get a flavor for how that is uh, actually doing at the same time. And then also the one to three year treasury agency, which includes agency securities. So it allows the committee to, to look at some uh, different flavors uh, of different types of securities and how they're, how they're performing with a similar type duration uh, structure. Great, thank you. And then moving on to page 20, here you can see the net of fees. So this uh, takes away uh, the Chandler fees and looks at the Chandler managed portfolio versus that of the benchmarks. You can see a very similar story here. Uh, you can see now that over the last three months, the portfolio earned five basis points net of fees. 12 months, it earned eight basis points net of fees and then since inception, 1.54% uh, net of fees. And you can see that also reflected in the table in the uh, graph above. And then on page 21, looking at a yield comparison. And so you can see that a three month T-bill is around four basis points today. A six month treasury bill is around five basis points. LAFE is at 25 basis points. The most recent reading from LAFE, uh, which was taken uh, last Thursday, it's down to about 22 basis points now. Commercial paper is around 10 basis points. Uh, a government money market fund is about a basis point. And then you can see the purchase yield on the city of San, San Clemente's portfolio is 1.08%. And so, you know, as long as we hold those portfolio those securities to, to maturity, which we hold most securities, if not all securities to maturity, the city's going to earn that 1.08% over that period of time. 
Here you can see the yield curve, page 22. So the table is on the left-hand side that shows the different terms and what looking at yields of those different securities. And then the graph is on the right-hand side. So you can see the gray line there is from three months ago and the green line there is our most recent. I said about a flattening yield curve. And uh, so what you can see here is that shorter term rates are a little bit higher out to three years. And then once you get beyond five years, you can see how rates have really come down. And that's really uh, looking at uh, what's been going on more recently in the markets. Uh, also with market participants thinking that maybe economic growth will be less than expected. Doesn't mean that the economy is gonna slip back into recession. I don't think that that's the uh, estimate at all. It just is uh, a little bit, uh, the expectations may have gotten ahead of themselves uh, based upon some of the variants and things that we're seeing and how that may impact the economy moving forward. And that's why you've seen the movement of those longer term rates down a little bit from where they were before. Here you can see compliance, page 23. And so the city's portfolio has an investment policy. This committee looks at that investment policy, makes changes to that. Uh, and uh, it aligns itself with California government code uh, and can be more restrictive than California government code, uh, but it cannot be more liberal. And so what you can see here is on page 23 and on page 24 is that the portfolio fully complies with the investment policy. And then this is looking at holdings. Uh, so on page 26, you can see the different companies that uh, the city holds in its portfolio. Uh, notice that government and then the investment type. Uh, and then on the far right hand side there, uh, you can see the percentage of the portfolio. Notice that the majority of those higher percentages are in government securities. And then below that, you can see the corporate securities. In fact, uh, the, these securities are less than 1% of the portfolio. So it's a very well diversified portfolio. And then I'm going to go through these very quickly on page 27, 28. This is looking at the holdings. Page 30, we start with some of the corporate notes. And then you can go page 31, and you can see the uh, negotiable CDs that are in the portfolio. Notice that all the negotiable CDs are, are 250,000 or less. So that means that they're fully FDIC insured. And you can see supranationals, and also you can see US Treasuries going on to page 34. And then this is looking at a maturity schedule. This is something that the Mark, the treasurer looks at on an ongoing basis uh, to look at what cash flows are coming up. And so we go from all the way from the start all the way to the longest maturity and we break it out by month. And those are in the subsequent pages here. And then here's some of the transactions that took place in the portfolio. And that concludes the presentation, Mark, unless you would like me to go on on the Chandler managed portfolio. The Chandler managed, um, yeah, do the Chandler managed and then I'll do the internally managed and sure. then um, we'll go from there. Sounds good. So moving on to page 48. And so you can see this is really our objectives our safety, liquidity and return. We also spell out the benchmark as far as moving over market cycles and then also the objectives really to, we can buy uh, for the strategy, high quality uh, securities, fixed income securities that comply with the investment policy and all the regulations governing the funds. Here you can look at page 49. This is looking at that same table versus that of the benchmark. And so what you can see here is on the maturity, you can see uh, the average maturity is 2.18 versus the portfolio, which is 2.28. The duration is 2.12 versus 2.13 of the portfolio. So right uh, along uh, the same lines of that. Uh, the average purchase yield is 1.51. The market yield is 0.36. It's a double A plus rated portfolio. And the portfolio is around $81.8 million. Here you can see how the portfolio is structured. And so you can see what US treasuries, you can also see corporates and you can also see the, the agency portfolios where we've had uh, some, some uh, uh, changes as far as not having as much of an allocation and where those allocations have really gone is really to asset-backed securities and also U.S. treasuries. Uh, Supernationals uh, have remained relatively the same and also the money market fund has uh, been used to uh, increase the uh, asset-backed securities and also U.S. treasuries. You can see on page 51, you can see the sector distribution. Uh, so you can see on June 30 on the left-hand side here, 
Uh, you can see that we own around 20, uh, almost 25% of the portfolio in US treasuries. Uh, Supernational is 2.5, money market fund is 0.2, corporates are 11.3%, agencies are around 56.9, and asset backed securities are around 4.3% of the portfolio. So seeing some increases there uh, in the asset back uh, piece of that and also US treasuries. Excuse me, Jason, if you could back up real quickly to page 49, I just want to point out a slight change we made to the uh, committee. So I, what I did is I asked Jason on the, um, on the channel manager to use the benchmark that is most appropriate um, Chandler fields to measure their portfolio. So in the past, you know, the, the city uses uh, the one to three year uh, you know, in, in terms of the investment policy. But when we're just looking at Chandler, we're using the zero to five US treasury. And then we'll also see uh, for the internally managed, we're using a different index when we're just looking at that portion. So anyway, that was just a slight change that we made. And um, if you have any thoughts or comments on it, let me know. Okay, thanks. Here you can see on page uh, 52, here you can see the uh, Chandler Managed Portfolio. You can see all the different issuers that are there. Uh, you can see that uh, going from left to right, it's the issuer name, the type of security and the percentage. Again, the majority of the portfolio is in government securities, and then the corporate securities are a little bit less than 2% if you go all the way down those different uh, categories. Here you can see the duration distribution. Here you can see uh, the portfolio as of June 30 in the green and as of March uh, in the gray line. And so uh, looking at the portfolio again, a lot of the securities in that uh, two to three year spot, but also we have some securities that were up further, about three to five years too, as a percentage of the portfolio. You can see that this portfolio fully complies with the investment policy on page 54 and page 55. And then uh, that concludes my presentation and I can answer any questions that you have. Any questions for Jason? Jason, I mean, just with regard to the, the zero to five year treasury benchmark, um, why do you choose that over like a zero to five year GovCorp index that would, you know, maybe to a greater extent reflect the substance or the types of securities in the portfolio, not just the duration? Yeah, the, the issue that we have with is really finding a zero to five year GovCorp index is right now through the major indice providers and I'll think of that for, uh, you know, if you think about uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch and or Barclays, they don't really have a zero to five year uh, government corporate index. And so the only zero to five year that they have today that they've constructed is treasuries. Uh, there is the possibility of blending those but typically I don't like to blend the benchmarks. I'd rather just use it from the providers and then provide additional uh, goalposts for lack of a better term, as far as looking how dif different corporates and things are uh, using those one to three year benchmarks. Okay, so why, why don't you like using a composite benchmark? I think that just in general, when you look at a composite benchmark, that's something that you've constructed. So you really have to blend all those different things together. And I really like to look at just those ones that actually come from the actual index providers mm -hmm. themselves. So there's really, you know, doing the math and things like that is not right. being done in the background. It's really being done by the provider themselves. Right, manipulating it to, to suit the statistics, so to speak. Yes. Okay. All right, any other qu questions for uh, Jason? Okay, Jason, are, are you gonna stick around and, and take yes. us? Okay, that'd be great. <laughs> so um, if you could then uh, take us to page 57, and this is the, uh, the same table that we've seen for both the uh, com uh, consolidated portfolio and the Chandler. And like with the Chandler one, what I asked Chandler to do for the internally managed is use a different index rather than the index that's uh, specified in the investment policy for the consolidated portfolio. So Jason and company um, kind of took a historical look at what the duration has been for the internally managed. And, and quite frankly, it's, it really gets all over the map, um, especially because LAIF has, you know, um, at least the way it's shown is a zero duration. Um, 
So anyway, they, they felt that the uh, six month treasury bill index would probably uh, is, has been what the average duration has been over the last, how many years, Jason? It's been over the last over five years. Okay, so last five years. So currently um, the duration of the internally managed portfolio is 0.41, but in any case, um, I'm sorry, it is 0.6 where the benchmark is 0.41. So you can see that the duration changed quite a bit between March 31st to um, 6.30. And that had to do with a couple things. One is a big inflow of revenues from property taxes mainly. And also um, toward the end of June, I, I redeployed about $11 million from LAVE, mostly into US treasuries, two, three, and, and four year, and also a million dollars in uh, ne negotiable uh, CDs, uh, three years. Because by investment policy, from the internally managed portfolio, we can only go out up to three years of NCDs. So that, that, that's the reason for the main increase in duration for the internally managed. Other than that, the, um, the purchase yield went from 0.75 to 0.64 and the market yield from 0.31 to 0.28. And you can see that the portfolio went up from 66 million to almost 79 million. Next page, please. So if you look at the table up above, you can see what I was just talking about under U.S. Treasuries, the first line item, the change um, was over $10 million. Agency went down a million, which was a maturity, and the negotiable CDs went up a million. And LAIF, even with all that, uh, still went up $2.5 million. Okay, next page, please. And there's a comparison of the two different time periods, the pie chart. Next page. And there's the duration distribution. And obviously it's far overweighted by uh, LAIF. Uh, so I like the next page much better because we strip out LAIF and um, cash deposits, money market fund. And this shows us you know, what securities, how securities are invested after that. So you could see just what I was talking about, the green bars in the two, three, three to four and four to five increased okay. quite a bit over the previous uh, period. Okay, next page. And even with all that, you can still see that LAIF represents 61%. Um, probably over the next four or five months, there'll be about a 16 to $18 million uh, burn off of, of uh, cash, uh, which we take from LAIF as we have negative cash flows and outlays compared to revenues coming in. So we'll see LAIF uh, decline quite a bit before fall. Okay, next page. Now, isn't there, a compliance page too for the internally managed. Did I miss that? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, guess not. All right. So the the remainder of the report, if you could just go through the initial part, one page at a time. Okay, that's the certification page. Keep going. And those are just the benchmarks disclosures. Keep going. That's all I have there. Okay. Um, Sandy, are you able to pull up the, the packet that went out? Yeah. Or? Did you want me to make you um, uh, co-host and uh, if oh, what? Why don't you we, to... Yeah, if you could do that. that. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. You should be it. Let's see. Let me. I I, I got it here. Okay. 
Well, wait a minute. Um, so I guess we have to check off all panelists. Okay, here we go. Okay, so are, are we seeing page 67? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so this is a, the uh, pension portfolio, which again, the investment committee does not oversee, nor does the city treasurer, but uh, we put it in here for the investment report uh, for purposes of public disclosure. Um, so if we go, and this is how the, uh, the funds are allocated to the different accounts. Page 69 is the cash flow. And then page 70 is probably a good uh, picture of the inflows and outflows and, and how they, um, you know, the property taxes are coming in in fall and spring. Uh, the outflows are, are pretty consistent to, to a certain degree. And then the uh, month by month cash flow um, estimates going out into the future. You can see going back to, to here's uh, parking here on page 71. If you look at the net cash flow, for instance, at the, um, let's go to the, excuse me, fiscal year 2022, the first column, July 21st or July of 2021, if you go down to almost the bottom where it says net cash flow, you could see that there's an outflow, projected outflow of roughly 6.6 .6 million, August 3.5, September 4.1, and October 2.4, before then we get a positive net cash flow. So that, that's what we have to allow for with LAIF and um, so forth. And below that, it also shows maturing investments. So you got 10 million in maturing investments to offset that. I'm sorry, Art? Yeah. yeah. Uh, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 10 million, a um, little over 10 million, 10 million, 500,000 in maturing investments. So it doesn't all come from, you know, only, two, only a portion of it is coming from uh, late. Well, it, yeah, it depends where those maturity investments are. If they're coming in the in term, or excuse me, if they're in the Chandler managed portfolio, we're not drawing on okay. any of those. I mean, it's there if we need to, but for the most part, I've never asked Jason to um, to send us any maturity investments, um, and I believe most of those are with Chandler. I could I can be wrong, but uh, okay. okay. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to skim through here unless anyone on the committee has any questions. Just more detailed cash flow reporting. So at this point, that's the end of the investment report. Are there any questions on it for Jason or myself? Um, if not, oh, we'll need a motion to accept the uh, report as presented. Oh, well. Okay, I can make the motion here, right? To, to you can. I just was welcoming you. <laughs> hey, I'm glad you sent out that second link. I was having problems with the first one, all right? You and everybody else. Yeah, oh, okay. Just thinking, hey, it's a lot easier when we're looking across the table at each other, all right? Eating your food. And, stuff. and by the way, since you bring that up, that's going to happen starting with the next meeting and we'll be meeting at, um, at the city city offices. Okay, so do I have a motion to accept the investment report as presented? So moved. Okay, Art, in a second? I can do a second. Al seconds it, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, so moved, thank you. Okay, the... the you know, Jason, at this point, um, 
I, I think your role is is complete here. The the only remaining item on the agenda is the broker dealer evaluations. So again, we thank you for all your great work and explanation and uh, reporting and look forward to, I'm sure talking to you before the next meeting, but uh, hopefully seeing you in person at that meeting, um, if you can make it. That's great. And Bill, I'm sure that I'll see you around at uh, different things. I'm sure we will, Jason. All right, thank you guys. Yeah, thanks we'll thanks you. for all your help for the sake of it. Thank you, Jason. Really it. Thank you, bye-bye now. Bye. Okay, so the brought you uh, committee members should have all received the broker dealer uh, questionnaires. We have one from Raymond James and one from Wells Fargo. Uh, currently, our two approved uh, broker dealers are Raymond James and RBC. Um, I, because we, we just don't do that much trading in the, probably the past year, I've only used. Raymond James, um, you know, and, and as, as you know, all I'm really purchasing are U.S. Treasuries, uh, agencies, and negotiable CDs in denominations of $250,000 or less. So my intention is to have three approved broker-dealers. We didn't ask uh, RBC for a uh, questionnaire because it takes a lot of work and effort. Um, I did want to get uh, Wells Fargo on our approved list. And this is the first time we've gotten a, a broker dealer questionnaire back from Kurt. And, and he's uh, a broker that uh, Bill as recommended as a good guy, very knowledgeable and a good firm, of course, being Wells Fargo. Um, so I don't know how much you've looked over the questionnaires, but any, any discussion or questions that we should be covering as a uh, committee? Well, you know, I know that Raymond James is uh, familiar with uh, our investment policy and such. So I was glad to see that Wells Fargo uh, indicated the same. That would be on page four. Mm -hmm. um, no, sometimes Mark in the past comments have been vague about that, you know, kind of like, Hey, if you're, it's up to you to manage it on your own. So no, it's good to have somebody say, you know, Hey, we understand that what, you know, what your investment requirements are and what the constraints are and that, you know, what we're, uh, we're going to be, making sure that what we recommend is complying with uh, the, those policies. Mm -hmm. But that was good. Yeah. Yeah, gen generally when, when I go to ask for quotes, I'll send them an updated uh, copy, you know, spreadsheet with our portfolio. Mm -hmm. And so that they can see what we have. It's especially important when we go, I go out to buy negotiable CDs because we don't want any uh, overlap in, in banks. Um, but in, in generally, I ask them to make sure that uh, what they're recommending complies with our investment policy. But again, what I'm purchasing is pretty plain vanilla. So it's, it's, it's mostly a issue of maturities and whatnot. So so what, I guess what I'm looking for from the committee is approval of both uh, Raymond James and Wells Fargo and to continue with also RBC um, as, as potential broker dealers so that we have at least three. Again, I don't intend to use at most two, but it's always nice to have three on the approval list um, so that we can do business where we, when and where we need to. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so do I have a motion to accept the three brokers as um, mentioned? I'll make that motion to accept the three brokers as mentioned. Thank you, Bill. Do I have a second? 
Yeah. Okay, I'll beat R to it. I'll second. Okay, I'll thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 So moved. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, is there any public input, Sandy? Or Josh? Uh, no, I don't see anyone else here. Um, I don't have any public input. Okay, so. great. <laughs> um, well, very good. I think that uh, that brings our meeting to a conclusion. Mark? Yes. Um, so I was just gonna say that uh, I am up for consideration uh, for another term uh, tomorrow night. Um, and, you know, I've been on the committee for a long time. So uh, city council actually might decide that, um, you know, they want somebody fresh on the committee. Mm -hmm. If that should be the case, I just want to say thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. Likewise, Art, you've brought a lot to the committee. I've enjoyed uh, your input over the years. And um, I'm sure the council is going to do what the council is going to do, as they usually do. So, but uh, I, I, I feel blessed as a treasurer to have, uh, quite frankly, a great investment specialist and two citizen representatives, which could uh, come close to being investment industry specialists. So, um, yeah, I think we've got a wealth of, of knowledge and background on the committee. And I appreciate all that you've done for so many years. Yep. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. And, and Al, did you uh, reapply? Yes, I did. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, we'll see what the, I don't, I don't even know how many um, applications they got, but uh, I guess you guys will see tomorrow. Who can be better than us? <laughs> That's not true. What? That's the what's, what's, what's not to love, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, listen, you guys, uh, have a great rest of your summer, and um, hopefully I'll see you back here in October. All right. So great to meet you, Sandy. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> Very good. So um, I, I to, to close it out, I'm going to uh, move that we adjourn the meeting to the the next regularly scheduled investment advisory committee meeting, which will be held on October 25th, 2021, at 5:30 at City Hall located at 910 Calle Negocio, conference room A. Do I have a second to that motion? Art? Okay, okay. okay sure. Art, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Yep. Aye. So moved. All right, thanks again. And thank you, Sandy, for moderating the meeting. Thanks for putting it all together here, Mark. <laughs> All right. Take care, all. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Best of luck.